Italy puts a quarter of its population into quarantine to contain the coronavirus. Should other countries follow suit, or is it too little too late to stop the spread? This is Inside Story. Hello, I'm James Bays. With the number of dead rising fast, the third highest number of cases worldwide and 16 million people forced into quarantine, Italy's government has ordered some of the harshest measures outside China to try and contain the coronavirus. Italy's economic heart is under strain. The financial and fashion capital Milan resembles a ghost town. All weddings, funerals, football matches and other large public gatherings are cancelled. Everyone's been banned from leaving 16 provinces in the north. Many flocked to train stations and airports before the lockdown came into force. It's at least until early next month. What is happening in my city is worrying me, and it's also saddening because Milan is a lively city, and to see it like this today it was almost a defeat for me. I never would have thought this would happen. We were able to leave because there were no instructions. I asked the Italian foreign office, and other than taking our temperature, they can't really do much. Italy's government is asking the European Union to implement urgent measures as the virus spreads quickly across the continent. The UK is imposing two weeks of mandatory self-isolation for anyone returning from northern Italy. France, with the second highest number of cases in Europe, has banned gatherings of more than 1,000 people. Let's bring in our panel to discuss all this further. Here in the studio with me, we have Andreas Kappis. He's a lecturer in the Department of Psychology at the University of London, who researches human behaviour and uncertainty. In Milan, via Skype, we have Marilisa Palumbo. She's a journalist and editor at the Italian daily newspaper Corriella della Sera. And in Geneva, Annie Sparrow, a professor of population, health science and policy at Mount Sinai. Welcome to you all. Thank you for joining us for this discussion. Marilisa, if I can start by speaking to you, we're going to talk about the facts here, we're going to talk about the science, but first, I want to get a little bit of a mood. Can you tell us what it feels like right now in Milan? You know, it's, it's really weird. Uh, everyone is anxious and worried uh, because everyone has to understand that this is really unprecedented and none of us uh, has ever had experience of something like this. Uh, most of the population has not fought through the wars, so um, this is really new and people are adjusting, uh, uh, companies are adjusting, um, doing smart work, uh, work from home, uh, but still it's, um, it's difficult also not to have contact with people. Uh, and um, yeah, so we, we are waiting and the numbers are always more worrying. OK, well, we'll talk about some of the restrictions that have been put in place a little bit later. But Annie in Geneva, I'd like to talk to you about the case of Italy. Why, in your view, as a public health expert, have things got so bad in Italy? Well, to begin with, um, Italy has a, has an older population and they are more vulnerable. And I think that although Italy started uh, off testing as soon as they thought about it, as soon as they could, it just wasn't apparent, um, the scale of it. And there are several lessons that we've learned from China that are only just becoming clearer now. First of all, um, even though China looks as if it contained or suppressed the epidemic by locking down Wuhan and placing people under quarantine. In fact, the whole country in China was placed on lockdown. There were, no one was allowed to travel anywhere. If you wanted to travel to Beijing, you had to self-quarantine for... You had to go to mandatory quarantine for 14 days. Now, in Italy, you know, locking down in you know, northern Italy, as, as we are seeing, is, is unlikely to be as effective. It could help in some way, you know, suppress some of the spread to Switzerland, you know, to Geneva, where I am, just north of Italy. But at the same time, I mean, this is a virus which exposes all the flaws in the healthcare system. And, you know, some of the first people to get infected were healthcare workers. And it has an older population than, for example, South Korea, which has a very similar number of cases infected. But, you know, Italy has seven times the number of deaths. So 
The virus itself exposes the flaws in the healthcare system, the flaws in infection prevention and control, and the vulnerabilities of the population that it is infecting. So here we have a really vulnerable elderly population or population with a lot of comorbidities. And the virus is bringing that to the fore. OK, Maralisa, if I can ask you about how this appears to have started in Italy. I know your newspaper has done a lot of work on this, and I believe um, it's all been traced to one town of 16,000 people in Lombardy. And also, it seems the local hospital might actually have spread the disease. Yeah, the problem is, uh, and it's happening, I think, everywhere in Europe and also in the US, that we don't have case zero, patient zero. So we know the first person that got infected, but we still don't know today who, from whom he took the virus. So that's the huge problem, and that's the problem that every country is facing right now. So it happened in Codogno, this small town, and, and it went undetected for quite a while until uh, the guy who, was, who he is really young, 38, um, got really sick. And then they tested him, and then they discovered that he got coronavirus. But in the meanwhile, you know, the whole hospital was infected, and the population around him. Also, he had a very um, strong social life, so he had done, done a marathon. Uh, he met so many people at the restaurants. And from there, you know, it was almost unstoppable. And I assume in those early stages, that the fact that so much is unknown adds, Andreas, to the scare factor in all of this. I mean, in some ways, it's almost the opposite. So in the beginning, if there's a lot of unknowns, I think our human mind is very well equipped with kind of keeping any type of threat at bay. So most people, when they hear about the virus the first time, when they hear about the spread of it, maybe in a different country, and the government is urging you to do small sacrifices in your daily life, most people will not be very willing to do that because they feel that they will be fine. I think uh, uh, what we know from uh, my research, but also also from research from others is that people are very good at kind of um, neglecting unwanted information as long as they can. So I think what you can see in most countries uh, very much matches uh, with the human mind that we in the beginning are very reluctant to give up anything, to sacrifice something, to invest a little bit more effort in order to kind of um, uh, increase the greater good. So I think in the beginning the unknown actually enhances our tendency to kind of reject anything that leads us to invest more effort or to kind of threaten us a little bit. Maralisa, I don't want to get too political here, but there is, of course, a political element to this. And there is the sort of historic backdrop, the historic tussle in Italy between the regions and the capital, Rome. How's that played out? Yeah, that's been a problem uh, both on a sanitary and medical point of view and also the political uh, handling of the situation uh, because every region uh, has, uh, you know, can choose its own epidemiologic um, settings, as, as to say, and uh, and the same with, uh, with politics. So the last uh, fight between uh, the Rome government and the regions uh, was about the lockdown uh, one of the governors of um, Veneto, one of the biggest regions uh, affected by, by the virus, uh, said that the measures are, um, are too strong. So I really think that, uh, of course, Italy is especially difficult because of the history you mentioned, um, but I also think that it, it will be difficult everywhere in the Western world. And so I guess that Italy is really a test case for everyone else watching because it's so much easier for a central government, who is an authoritarian government, to uh, put in place uh, tough restriction and uh, you know I implement them. Uh, but for an open society, it's uh, much more difficult. You say a test case and a case study for many countries around the world, and some of that test is how much you should contain people and what's your message to them. Uh, it's worth telling you that one of the leaders of Italy's governing coalition tried to pass on messages. Uh, Nicola uh, Zingaretti called for calm in a video he recorded while he was on isolation at home after a week ago posting this photo on Instagram saying, let's not lose our habits. We can't shut down Milan or Italy. Our economy is stronger than fear. Let's go for an aperitif, a coffee, 
or a pizza. So that's one of the key political leaders who now has the coronavirus. How does that add, Andreas, to the scare factor in all of this? Well, I think um, it's for governments, for uh, health organizations, it's a very fine balance to kind of trying to get people alert and uh, induce a sense of urgency that they should stay at home, for instance, that they maybe should avoid going to public places, that they should uh, wash their hands regularly and so forth. So they need to induce a little sense, but then they don't want to have it uh, kind of flip into a panic. So I think um, in, in so I think that's a very fine line these organizations have to thread. So on the one hand, uh, what we know is that if um, uh, officials stress how uncertain it is that, for instance, if you go out, you might be fine, others might be fine. If we stress that uncertainty, people become very optimistic and they kind of feel like, well, things will be fine, I don't have to do anything. And on the other hand, if you want to kind of empt up the panic button a little bit, then emphasizing on the harm uh, of the disease, then this will increase more panic. So you can see in Italy, more deaths are reported. You might have heard of somebody who you know who died or who's in, uh, in danger of dying. Now, the well-being of other people becomes, uh, is at the forefront of people's minds. And now, people become very pessimistic and you know, set uh, into this more panic mode, which has, ironically, some benefits because it leads people to be more preventive, to me, uh, to be more precautious in their actions. But obviously, for the individual, feeling a sense of panic and anxiety and pessimism around them is not great for their well-being. But of course, it also has a disastrous effect on the stock markets, which are plummeting, on the oil price, which is crashing. Uh, Maralisa, um, back to you. Just quickly tell us what the restrictions are that you are now facing? So, OK, so the lockdown area, which is not really a quarantine area like Wuhan, uh, but still there are restrictions. So you cannot go in and out this huge area, Lombardy and 16 provinces. Uh, but the thing is that you, it's very up to the single person because you need a self-certification to go out and in. And of course, they are doing checks and there are some checkpoints somewhere, but not everywhere. So, um, I mean, if you get caught, uh, then you risk uh, even to go to jail, but uh, still they cannot control everyone. OK, uh, but that's why can, you, can you, for example, go to a restaurant? Can you go to work? Can you go shopping at the moment? OK, no. The bar and restaurants are open only until 6 p.m. and then they are closed, so you cannot go to a restaurant in the evening. And most of the shops are closed. Um, theaters are closed. Movie theaters are closed. Uh, all sports events are um, being transmitted closed doors, so without public without an audience and um, we, you cannot go to gym you can go to work but you know only so, so some companies are working from like everyone is working from home other companies are you know doing some shift so that there are um, less people around in the offices Annie those are the restrictions now in Italy do you think they are sensible restrictions and what should other countries make of them Coming back to the lessons learned from China, it was the same there where, as in, no one was allowed out. Anyone who was out had to wear a mask. Um, people were strongly discouraged from, you know, leaving the home uh, and in some places weren't allowed to. Um, now, you know, as Marilisa pointed out, you know, a government in open societies can't enforce those measures. I think it's deeply important for the governments to actually tell the truth and for there to be no spin, you know, no political profiteering, because public trust depends on, you know, public health depends on public trust. So in order for those, you know, those conditions to actually be effective, um, then you have to be able to trust that they are going to work. And in reality, they will work um, to a limited uh, degree. Um, but, you know, the problems are, you know, you know again, coming back to, the patient zero, we don't know the patient zero in any country. We don't know it in China. We still don't know the origin of the virus. We don't know the animal. And we do know that, you know, healthcare workers in hospitals are quite often sites of transmission. And that's exactly what happened in Lombardy. And there were several, um, you know, in the first week, there were several, five, I think, patients, um, five healthcare workers infected. And 
So this is a sort of an ongoing problem. Until we get a handle on that type of transmission and the transmission that we can't see, the invisible transmission that is, uh, you know, passed on, you know, as one of the first you know, persons did when you're not aware of it, school kids um, are not going to die from this disease, but they certainly can get sick. They won't have a fever. It's much harder to detect. And, and that's why, of course, you know, Italy has taken the drastic step of, of, of closing all the schools. So, down. Annie, However, so, so Annie, let me ask you about um, the lesson for you know, other Italy, countries from this, um, because in Italy, as you see, the public gatherings have been severely uh, restricted, and yet in other countries, very close by, you're in Switzerland, you know the situation in France, where gatherings of over a 1,000 people uh, are banned. Germany, though, where, where Andreas comes from originally, they're still having football matches, potentially with tens of thousands of people attending. Here in the UK, um, opening in a matter of hours, one of the biggest horse racing festivals in the world, the Cheltenham Festival, is going ahead. I'm told over the days of that, uh, there's about a quarter of a million people attending. If you had an elderly relative... What would you say to them? Should they, in France, in the UK, in Germany, should they attend sporting events if they're over 70? What's your advice? Well, that's a very specific way of protecting people. And, yes, I think it is important. I mean, all of these things are taking place, as you say, in the UK and in Germany, and to some degree that's really helpful for populations. I mean, we're humans and we really... You know, we are a social people, so it's very, very hard with this virus. This is not a war, you know, a disaster where it's the spirit of the Blitz and we can, you know, get together to uh, to combat it because that is one of the ways the virus wins. Um, in the US, of course, this is March Madness. This is like college, you know, the basketball season. And, you know, it's, um, you know this is a, a very difficult sort of time for lots of countries. And... I know, I think we do have to protect, you know, the, the, the groups that we know are particularly vulnerable. And remembering, you know, there's been a lot of uh, times when this virus has been compared with Spanish flu, which had a mortality rate of 2%. Now, in Italy, we see a mortality rate of 5%, which is pretty high. Um, and what, but what people forget about Spanish flu is that a lot of people died not from the virus, but from the bacterial pneumonia that followed. So I think we have to start getting really smart about how to protect those who are vulnerable, those who have other comorbidities like cancer or immune depression, and saying, OK, let's, let's anticipate they might need antibiotics for bacterial disease. Let's make sure they have absolutely optimal nutrition. Let's make sure they have excellent care. Let's think about how we might want to, uh, you know, quarantine or provide extra protection now to residential villages. One of the reassuring things about this virus is that kids do seem to be protected by virtue of being a kid, which is great. That's not what we saw in H1N1 and swine flu in 2009. And pregnant women were, you know, very much disadvantaged also because we saw, you know, some, you know that their unborn babies were very much at risk. That's not something that we saw particularly in SARS, you know, at all. So at least we have some positive pieces here where... Um, closing the schools makes good sense in many ways so that schools' kids don't get it asymptomatically and then, and then shed it, particularly to grandparents. Um, Annie, I, it's, Annie, Annie I'll, I'll stop you there for a moment because I noticed um, that you referred to the situation in the US as being like March madness. Um, let me refer you to a comment that came from a chap called Thomas Bossert. He was the Homeland Security Advisor of the United States, and he was that job for the beginning of the Trump administration, and yet he has said this on Twitter. There is a clear lesson for economic advisers worried that school closures and social distancing will lead to economic loss. There's no advantage to being a late mover. Now Italy will lose unrecoverable productivity and be too late to prevent peak disease spread. Andreas, that's a former advisor of President Trump, and President Trump coming out and attacking the Democrat Party and saying everyone, including the media, is overreacting. One assumes it doesn't help the situation if everyone's not on the same page. Well, I think there are, I mean, there are several potentially negative consequences for that. I think if the situation turns uh, dire in the US, then uh, I think uh, the US government would have to have a, a somewhat of a U-turn. I think uh, the speakers before and really highlighted how important trust is. If you undermine that trust, how then you react to that? I think 
Um, and so that would be, uh, I think, uh, 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 a negative consequence of that if we kind of like now say, oh, this is not a problem, and it turns out it is much more of a problem. I think in uncertain situations to any leader, and I think this is what uh, 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 was said beforehand, it's important if it's uncertain to say that it is uncertain because once things turn around, then you lost the people, you lost the trust. So for instance, if you say, this is not a problem, as, it is, as if it would be certain, and then it turns out it's actually a problem, then you kind of lost people. So I think one of the recommendations we psychologists always have to kind of highlight, this is not a certain situation, it is uncertain, these are the consequences, and let people make their minds up. Annie, is there a nightmare scenario for all of Europe, and we've got to think about the whole world here, that in Europe, Italy is not the worst, it's just the first? <coughs> Yes, easily. And we, we really don't know what look this looks like. You know, uncertainty is the defining characteristic of any pathogen. And pathogens themselves are apolitical, but epidemics are not. I mean, pathogens don't distinguish between right and left, between dictators and democracies. But epidemics do. The politicisation can be very important and often is. And finger pointing, as we know, doesn't help. But, you know, this is the first time we've seen, you know, we're in the beginning of a nascent pandemic, and this is our first experience of that. We have no global, we have no European immunity, we have no protection, we have no treatment. And um, so, you know, what we, and I think we, what we do know, again, sort of trying to learn some lessons from China is that China was able to sort of ship in almost 50,000 extra healthcare workers. Now, we can't do that here. The US can't do it there. And we're going to see this sort of um, evolution of the virus as it becomes endemic with year-round transmission. OK, Maralisa, and, I mean, we've seen that. as you watch all this, Maralisa, playing out around the world, having seen things close up in Italy, what do you think the lessons are? The lessons are that you have to be careful from the beginning and start taking uh, harsh measures from the beginning. Because the problem in Italy, you also mentioned Nicola Zingaretti, uh, the governor of Lazio and also the leader of the Democratic Party who got sick and the, the week before he was in Milano having a spritz, an aperitivo. Um, the, the thing was in Italy that we had the first week of panic and then the second week, because everyone was so scared about the economic consequences of what was going on, uh, they said, Milano riparte, Milano goes on, you know? And uh, so politicians, uh, uh, entrepreneurs, they said that everything was fine, was going to be fine. And it wasn't. OK, so Marilisa, they... I'm going to stop you there and go back to Annie, because this has been a really quite depressing conversation. Anyone who's watching this around the world is going to be worried. What's your final thought as the public health professional here on the panel? We do have some things to look forward to. Uh, China has, has almost finished a trial of the drug remdesivir, which seems to be effective in treating people, so that's good news. That's going to be a mile marker. As I said, kids the fact that kids are, are, are protected by virtue of being a kid, that's useful. I think one of Europe's you know, greatest strong points here is that we're still a very social uh, you know, conglomeration, and we need to remember that we're protecting people, not borders, and that's a far stronger you know, uh, focus point than simply raising the drawbridge and inserting travel bans and travel restrictions. We know what works. We know that we need to be able to test people, we need to you know, be able to trace people, and we need to be able to look after people, and we have to be able to protect healthcare workers because once we lose them, then we're in, in serious danger, and we need to know how to protect our vulnerable groups. I think that we are actually learning, and we're going to have a lot more data in the next two weeks. OK, well... Thank you. Thanks to our three experts, Marilisa Palumbo in Milan, Professor Annie Sparrow in Geneva and Andreas Kappis with me in London. There are lots of unknowns out there, but hopefully what we know, and perhaps more crucially what we don't yet know, are a bit clearer after this programme. Coverage of the coronavirus continues around the clock on Al Jazeera and on aljazeera.com, where you can watch this programme anytime you want. You can make your comments or suggestions of what we should discuss next time around. From me and all the team in Doha and London, keep washing your hands. I'll see you soon.